Hi everyone, this is Neil Wright, as here, consultant, audiologist and director of Cluax. Thank you for joining me in my latest video. So the patient who has to attend every year or so and they suffer from chronic otitis externa. So otitis externa is an umbrella term, if you like, for an infection and or inflammation of the outer ear. And our outer ear consists of the satellite dish we have on either side of our ears, known as the pinna, so the flap of cartilage, um, the auditory canal, and also the outermost layer of the eardrum. So the eardrum is three ply thick, so it's got three membranes. The outermost layer is lined with the same epithelial skin that lines the inner two thirds of the ear canal. Then you have a middle layer, which is made up of fibrous connected tissue. And then the innermost layer of the eardrum is made of mucosa, mucosal skin cells. It's the same skin or similar skin that lines the inside of our nose and mouth. So it's more secretory. And subsequently, this patient develops a lot of um, keratin accumulation, so dead skin. So the outermost layer of the skin, it itself has four layers, but the most superficial layer is known as a stratum corneum. It's actually dead skin, so there's no nucleus, no intracellular fluid, no organelles. Metabolically speaking, it's inactive, and instead this outermost layer of skin contains bundles of keratin. So keratin is a protein that's also found in our fingernails, our hair strands, and keratin is quite a useful protein because it gives this outer most superficial layer of skin its strength and rigidity because it's of course exposed to the external uh, world. Um, keratin is also highly reflective of harmful UV sun rays so it protects the skin and it's hydrophobic. Um, you don't want your skin to absorb too much water so it does the stratum corneum does absorb some water to keep it moisturized but you, you want it to prevent it to overhydrate because if it overhydrates these um, the skin cells um, the corneokites that form the stratum corneum they overhydrate and then they swell and burst and then they can um, break down the, the membranes um, which then exposes the inner layers of skin so it macerates the skin and you can see this is just dead skin it may look like earwax but it's not and once we remove this we're going to perform a, a dead skin peel of the canal wall. This is their left ear. This is the worst ear. Um, so the right ear is also occluded. This is, in fact, the right ear was a bit more tricky to remove the dead skin because they had a much narrower entrance to the ear canal. So even this left ear was quite narrow, but the right side more so. But the condition, the overall health of the right ear, I would say is better than their left ear. Now, this patient's been to their GP um, and they've been referred to ENT, and it's just managing the condition, really. So the key things here is to avoid water. By um, allowing water to enter the ear, it's going to exacerbate this patient's otitis externa, and that's for several reasons. Um, water, at least in the UK, it's more neutral in pH, so it will elevate the pH level of the ear. The ear should be mildly acidic. The acidity, or the mild acidity of the ear, inhibits the colonization and growth of harmful bacteria. So our ears are full of bacteria and fungi, but under normal conditions, they're non-pathogenic. So the bacteria that reside in the ear, they, are, um, they prefer the mildly acidic conditions, but they're not harmful. But if the pH level increases, you can get colonization of more neutrophilic bacteria, which, uh, generally speaking, are more pathogenic. Um, so that's one of the reasons why we avoid water. Uh, and of course, water does contain some of these pathogenic bacteria that I was referring to. Um, so that's definitely one thing. And this patient is uh, avoiding water. But I mean, I think their condition was far worse than this. They used to get a lot of otorrhea discharge. So although it's still they're still suffering from otitis externa, it's nowhere near as bad as it used to be. Uh, water, it can wash away any natural oils and sweats that this ear produces. So the natural oils and sweats, so the, the oils are sebum, which is secreted by the sebaceous glands, which are connected to the hair follicles of the hair strands that are located in the outer cartilaginous portion. So sebum is an oily lipid structure secretion, and it helps to moisturize the skin. It provides, a, or it's also acidic as well. And... 
um, you get an oily sweat secreted by the cerumunus glands and combined this oily sweat and oily lipid secretion help to moisturize the skin so it provides a hydrophobic layer so it helps the stratum corneum that it sits on top to retain any internal moisture that it has and it prevents overabsorption of water because the overabsorption of water um, as I said will macerate the skin so if you get too much water in eventually that water is going to break down that acid mantle that oily lipid um, and sweaty secretion um, particularly if it's warm water because it will just leach it away um, so yeah so if you, particularly if you've got a tight external you need to avoid water in the air so we removed the blockage now I'm just peeling away as much as much dead skin as possible this skin is really tough and adherent so I think I'm going to put some um, medical grade olive oil just to loosen it to help me peel it away I'm using the fine end suction probe and slowly but surely we are removing some of just put some oil in there that's their second bend to the left so there's a bit of skin here so we're going to try to get underneath it it's almost like sticky tape uh, on a piece of paper or an envelope when you're trying to peel that away or an old stamp. Uh, but you want to do it without obviously damaging the paper or the envelope. Just got a bit blurry as though, so just mopped some um, oil away from the entrance. Because you've got the hairs at the entrance, they can get coated in the oil. So when you insert the endoscope, you can sometimes smear against the lens. So this is the anterior canal wall, just got underneath, and it's quite a thick blanket of skin. Just peeling it away from the sides to the to the middle because we won't we don't want to poke into the bony part of the ear canal because this is all bone here underneath this very thin layer of skin. So just doing it slowly but surely. It's really tough. Sometimes the skin just peels away really easily, but on this occasion it's quite adherent, it's quite th a thick blanket. So we're going to be a bit more careful here because. As you can see, I'm leveraging the skin away from the ear canal. We just don't want the point of the suction tip to go anywhere near the eardrum. And you can see the, the, there's quite a lot of humidity in the ear, which normally indicates some inflammation of the ear canal. So I'm just mopping up some at the bottom. There's a bit of crusted skin just on the left-hand side of the screen. It's out of view at the moment, which, which we will remove. I'm just trying to hover over. I don't want to graze the canal. When the, when the ear canal is inflamed, it's more susceptible to laceration. So if you do scratch the ear, it's more likely to bleed. So we're just going to be really careful. And that's obviously then going to exacerbate the otitis externa. So yeah, we don't get every little last speck, but I've got a tremendous amount out there. Just hoping. So this is kind of a young, a young patient actually. I think they're in the mid um, teens. So just hoping as this patient gets older, it just improves and it is improving. It has improved. I've been seeing this patient for a few years now. So moving on to the left side again, there's a lot of humidity. So here the skin is right near the entrance. I'm having to use the side of the left hand side of the, the endoscope to stretch the ear open and because the wax is or the skin in this case is so close that's why it's magnified and reflective at this stage i think the endoscope is actually out of the ear it's just and i'm just trying to wriggle this through i think now i'm resting the endoscope actually on the tragus which is the so the tragus is the, the triangular flap of cartilage that is just got in front of the entrance of the ear canal the endoscope here is technically not in the ear, but that can make it a bit more difficult to remove because the ear canal entrance is somewhat narrow. But I'm just trying to wriggle it through. So to stretch that, so on the left-hand side, where the suction probe is, on the, to the left of the suction probe, that's the first bend. So we typically use the left-hand side of the endoscope to position it against that first bend where the hairs are protruding out from and push that cartilage to the left to, almost to open up the ear. But at the moment, I've just got the endoscope out of the ears. I'm just using the right angle ear hook now. It's just a bit too mushy, so it's cutting through. But I think later on, the ear, I used the ear hook to remove it, if memory serves me correct. There's a gap there, so I'm just going to see if I can get the ear hook there. 
can see it's just a bit um, foggy. That's the humidity. When you're performing microsuction, so, so when you've got increased um, humidity and warmth in the ear, the, the lens of the endoscope that enters the ear, that's going to be the coldest part. So you get all that humidity condensing on the lens of the endoscope. But as soon as you put the microsuction probe in, when you're removing air from the ear, it reduces the ear temperature. So it kind of regulates and almost um, equalizes the um, temperature in the ear to that of the tip of the endoscope. So the misting and the fogging goes away instantly. And in fact, it's the tip of the endoscope, uh, of the suction probe, sorry, that's the coldest part. So you probably get all the condensation there instead. So I've just put some oil in. I'm just trying to wriggle this through. So on the right, that flesh there, that's the second bend. To the left, where the hairs are poking out. And also from the top, that's the first bend. So this is the narrowest section of the ear. So slowly getting it through. At this stage, you can actually see this keratin plug externally without any magnification because it was hanging out of the ear. But it's just trapped there. I think I'm going to just get the right angle correct just to get some leverage. It's got, it's got obviously a bit more surface here. Now, the right angle correct, it's a hybrid design. So most jobs and horns are round. Then you can get some oval jobs and horns. Now, they've both got their, their benefits, and that's why I used, I've, I've designed the correct as a hybrid. So the base of the, the right angle correct has the same it's three millimeters wide similar to a normal Jobson horn but the tip it's two millimeters so it's like the oval one so I think with the oval one you like that narrow tip because it allows you to go deeper in the ear but then it just doesn't have that overall surface area that the round Jobson horn has so I've incorporated the you know the, 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 the advantages of both into my design and with my angle correct also there's a curvature um, so it mimics the curvature. Obviously, everyone's ear canals have got different curvature, but the average curvature. So when you're gliding against the canal wall, there's less friction. And the tip of the correct, not only is it narrower like the oval shaped, actually, it's a bit narrower than the oval one. It's also tapered, so it thins. So you can use the tip of the Jobson horn or of the right angle correct, sorry, to get in and behind the wax, even if it's compressed against the canal wall. So I'm just using the fine end. You can see the overall health of this ear looks better. The, the, it's less inflamed, there's less erythema, so less redness. It's more pink in complexion. But you've still got this thick blanket of skin, so I'm just using the fine end. It's coming away in three parts there. Again, there's going to be some skin left over because it's impossible to get every little last flare. You'd be there. Well, this so we allocate 30 minutes for procedure. And typically, uh, the, no, the mo your routine ear wax removal can take a few a couple of minutes max, both ears. But um, I always allocate half an hour because there's things to do prior to the appointment, um, doing the procedure itself, and then post-procedure, there's, there's always things to do, such as decontaminating the endoscope, um, wiping down, the clinical areas and then we've got our medical um, clinical notes to write up and then sometimes we have to do referrals so um, we can do that in that a lot of time and then obviously you need to prepare for the next patient read the clinical notes so half an hour for your routine appointments it's it, it's fine but obviously when you've got more complex procedures it can take up the bulk of that half an hour Again, I'm just going to put the sucker in just so I can really see what's going on. So make sure there's residual oil there because without the suction, you're going to get condensation. But I don't think it looks fine. Well, I hope you enjoyed that video, guys. Take care, keep well, and speak soon. Bye.